Construction is now underway in Brazil for the world's third largest dam project. 24,000 people will be displaced to make way for the dam. On this program, we ask if the social and ecological impacts of the project, Belo Monte, and similar projects in the region outweigh the benefits. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. Plans for a multi-billion dollar dam project on the Xingu River in northern Brazil have long been controversial. Once complete, the 11,000 megawatt dam is supposed to provide a source of clean energy for Brazil's growing needs. But critics say it will only help local industries and not the general population. And some claim it will be one of the most inefficient hydropower projects in the history of Brazil. Until a few months ago, the future of the Belo Monte Dam seemed in doubt. The project faced a wave of legal battles and opposition from indigenous groups and environmental organizations around the world. About 400 square kilometers of the Amazon forest will be flooded to make way for the reservoirs. Environmentalists also point to the loss of biodiversity in the region and the risk of extinction of hundreds of species of fish in the Xingu River. But it's the social effects on the local population which frequently make the headlines. About 24,000 people are expected to be displaced to make way for construction. The consortium behind the project say the environmental impact will be minimal. Gabriel Elizondo visited the Belo Monte site as construction was starting. I've been covering this story for over five years, but I'm one of the first international journalists that's been given access to film the opening phase of the building of the Belo Monte Dam. There are already 5,000 people working here, but by the height of the construction at the end of 2013, there will be 20,000. The builders are so confident that they're already on schedule, they tell me that by the end of February of 2019, the entire project should be complete at a cost of around $14 billion. Now, indigenous rights activists and environmentalists, they are still holding out hope for any last minute injunction that could halt any further construction here, or at least they want to call more attention to what they say are going to be the negative impacts of this dam. But as you can see, with each passing day, construction here continues. This is the community of Santo Antonio. It's more than 30 years old, and it's more than 60 families that used to live here. But it's right in the path of the construction zone. Just over that hill is the Rio Xingu, and less than a kilometer in this direction is a construction site. The construction company has been negotiating with these families to pay them to relocate, and more than half have already left. The construction company building Belomonte is offering compensation to people that own homes in the construction area. And as soon as these families leave, this is the end result. The house is destroyed. The construction company puts up a sign that says they now own this area and no one else can enter. The cemetery here has also been closed and anyone that wants to claim the remains of any loved ones can do so and move them to another location. But already every tombstone has been marked by these sticks that say UHEBM which stands for Hydroelectric Dam, Belo Monte. So should a country's economic development and energy needs outweigh the social and ecological impacts of big infrastructure projects like that of the Belo Monte Dam? We're joined by Eve Bratman from the American University. She worked in Brazil on development projects. In Rio de Janeiro, we have Emilio Larovere. He's an environment consultant. And also in the studio, we have Ken Green, who's a specialist in energy and environment at the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome to all of you to the studio. Thank you. you know, it looks like what we have here is a classic struggle, one that we often see in developing countries. On the one side, government and big corporations, progress, economic development, call it what you will. On the other, we have indigenous people who see their land being destroyed and who see their way of life being destroyed as well. Eve Bratman, you know, when we looked at that report there from Brazil, we saw that construction has begun already. So has this battle already been lost as far as the indigenous people are concerned? I would say not. Um, the indigenous people of the region have pressed legal claim that they have not had free and prior informed consent. And so this case has been brought to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. 
and Brazil continues to remain in the public spotlight, especially as it's about to be host to the, the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit this June, as well as, of course, the Olympics and the World Cup. It's withdrawn its ambassador from that hearing, hasn't it? It, it has. It, it has tried to snub the international community, but that's not to say that the international community or the Brazilians themselves that are most closely affected by this project are in any way giving up their struggle. Okay, let's go to Emilio in Rio de Janeiro. Emilio, uh, has the Brazilian government done any kind of environmental impact study? Yes, uh, there is a legal procedure in the country. Every big project like that has to pass through environmental impact study and get an environmental license. And this was also done in the case of Belamonte actually uh, as it's a project that actually affects indigenous uh, people the authorization for starting the study has to be granted by the congress itself and this was done and there were uh, uh, studies made in public hearings of course as you know always controversial by nature but uh, the environmental permit was issued with a number of conditions in terms of mitigation actions and compensation also for the local communities. Now we are in the point to see if these uh, requirements will be met during the construction phase. Okay. Ken Green, it's a fine balancing act, isn't it? On the one hand, you know, countries want to progress, they want economic development, etc. On the other hand, you have the interests of indigenous people. Uh, how does Brazil go about this? Well, I mean, the, the, the issue is that trade-offs are unavoidable in everything we do. Uh, just even being here today, there were other choices I could have made. And so everything we do is involves trade-offs, not only in developing countries, but in developed countries as well. When we try to site an energy facility here, the exact same trade-offs uh, happen. The way they play out is somewhat different. Uh, I think what's important is, is that uh, we have to have, a set of uh, have an understanding of context here. That is, developed societies are energy societies. And to the extent that we empower individuals, literally giving them access to greater amounts of power, we give them more options, we give them more opportunity, we give them more ability to be productive and therefore amass uh, wealth and, and health and all the other things we associate with developed countries and societies. So uh, at the same time, though, we do have to follow the procedures to make sure that people's rights are respected. Uh, that the environmental impacts are accounted for and worked into the process so you're actually internalizing the costs of what you do to the environment and the, the people affected. Uh, but I, I think these kind of projects are uh, important. Empowering human beings around the world, I think, generally speaking, is an important and, and virtuous activity. Uh, and we just have to honestly deal with these trade-offs. We have to be honest, not exaggerate what they are, or the costs, or the benefits, and move forward in, a, in, in an honest and an open and transparent manner. I think that's the important. Okay, Eve Bratman, two issues that were brought up. One, uh, as Ken pointed out, developed societies are societies that consume energy. The other brought up by Emilio, uh, in where he said that, look, uh, the environmental impact study was done, certain conditions were placed. I just, before you answer that, I want to take a look, a closer look, um, at the dam project and its impact. Now, the dam is being built in uh, Brazil's northern Para state, which is home to large parts of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, now, that's the Shingo River, and some 25,000 indigenous people live along its banks. One indigenous group, the Pakikamba, live downstream from the main dam. If the dam is built, the normal flow of the river would shrink significantly. The Pakikamba say their fish stocks would be severely depleted. Those are just some of the impacts we know, but there's obviously going to be long-term impacts as well, right? Absolutely, and, and I think to Ken's point about transparency and openness as well as to the point on, on the environmental impact assessments, it's really important to get some of the myths and the facts straight about this dam. First of all, the dam didn't pass the first environmental impact assessment that was done, and many officials uh, and people close to the administration at local levels within the environmental agency um, have charged the Brazilian government with ousting the people within its own environmental agencies as well as within the indigenous agencies for um, not putting the rubber stamp, as it were, on the environmental impact assessment. And so one of my main concerns is that the people that are closest to this project have ultimately not had uh, a full consultation or even a, a totally legitimate environmental impact assessment done because the federal government is so gung-ho about moving forward with this project. Uh, another fact to, to clarify is that the Brazilian government forecasts that this dam is only going to cost them $8 billion. When 
most studies of these large infrastructure projects show that they tend to cost at least twice that. Some analyses of the Bellamonti project have projected that it's going to cost at least $16 billion. And that's without some of the more ecological economics accounting brought into, into, into consideration, such that the costs of payment for ecosystem services and, and other assets environmentally are not being accounted for. Well, let's listen to what some of the people on the ground have been saying about this project. Now, Al Jazeera has been speaking to nearby residents and indigenous communities about the Belomonte Dam. Let's listen to some of those opposing the project. We're against Belomonte because it's not viable for our community and it's not a model of development that we want. For us, the dam will have a big negative effect and no benefits. It will produce energy for others, and we will be left with the damage. Belamonte is tearing apart our community and kicking us out of here forcefully. We have no option. Uh, so, Emilio, there, were, there are the voices there of Brazilian people on the ground opposing this project. Uh, it would seem, when one looks at it from the outside, that the Brazilian government has not exactly been acting in good faith. I mean, why did they withdraw their ambassador to this Human Rights Commission, which was going to look into and investigate the impact that this uh, dam would have on people living on the ground there? Yes, uh, I think that the main appeal uh, to the government is the economic feasibility of this amount of energy for the system. Uh, it's very hard to tell uh, uh, if the government uh, is acting in, in, in bad faith. I, won't, I wouldn't say that. I would say that there, there are many concerns in the government regarding, of course, sovereignty of, uh, in the Amazon and so on. And this explains the kind of hard position of the government in terms of the organization of American states, for instance. But I think the, the main uh, appeal to the uh, Brazilian government is actually the amount of energy at uh, a low cost compared with the other possibilities from thermopower or even other hydropower plants, not to speak nuclear and solar and wind, which are still more expensive than hydropower. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go that far that uh, the government is in bad faith. Of well, course, you know, one, one of the other the reasons... ...of enforcing... Right, Emilia, one of the other reasons Sorry? I said that... One of the other reasons is that in 2008, there was an assessment that was done. Uh, it so happened that the people who, may, who were in the, in the administration at the time, who agreed that there were serious concerns raised by the construction of this dam, were removed from the administration. Well, uh, I think there are uh, always problems in terms of uh, the respect of the minority. It is always a drama for people, as you mentioned, uh, the cemetery that has to be removed. The important thing, uh, I think, is to have a demo democratic uh, process that gets the, the majority of people happy with the outcome of actually building the project. Now, in the construction phase, it's very important to enforce the regulations, the environmental permits, and also all the conditions put forward for the respect of the minorities. It's also important to say that the region is very poor. It's not like you're going to a paradise and then you're destroying a paradise. The 4,300 families that will be displaced live in very bad conditions, very low income, very precarious houses, and so on. So uh, the big challenge actually to make this project or any other big project in developing countries, and particularly in the Amazon, as an opportunity for local development. There are a number of uh, economic compensations and uh, uh, if the resources that will be generated by this project that will go to the state of Pará and will go to the municipalities are uh, well used. Of course, this will translate into development opportunities to the people living there. But this is part right. of the democratic process to make politicians and government spend well the resources. Okay, I want to come to that issue of the benefits that local people accrue from development projects like this. But first, Eve Bratman, let me ask you this. You know, you heard the Emilio mention energy self-sufficiently, uh, self-sufficiency rather. Now, the Brazilian president, Dilma Rousseff, she went one step further. She said that this dam will form an essential component of Brazil's energy security. So does that justify construction? Uh, to me, it doesn't. I am, I am fully on board with Brazil's desire to keep its economic growth um, 
continuing and also of course for rural electrification and for people to have the economic returns that that they deserve from from all of their their work and also that they need quality of life improvements in the region there are uh, as our guest said very significant precarious uh, living conditions for many people of that region the issue here though is that Brazil could could really have significant energy gains if only it improved the efficiency of many of its existing dams, which are not yielding the electric potential that uh, they originally hoped or that were forecast in the first few years. And then since that infrastructure has started to deteriorate, the productivity levels have gone down considerably. Another issue here is that Brazil could capitalize on its wind potential, which even though it's expensive in the startup costs, the prices have gone down considerably in the past few years for, for wind construction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is another huge energy efficient potential that I think uh, the government might be well served to explore further before damming the last untapped, tribu un uh, the last currently undammed river uh, that's a tributary to the Amazon. I would take exception to a couple of points there. We, we know that retrofitting uh, things is actually considerably less efficient than building new uh, over time. And the argument that there are efficiency gains has become a sort of mantra in the environmental community, which it turns out doesn't really pan out. Uh, the idea that people are just allowing wealth to, to be flowing, literally flowing down the river that they can capture, doesn't seem to be the case. When you look at the cost of retrofits, uh, they don't give you the kind of return on investment that you think they might in the ideal world. Uh, and the other question is regard to alternatives. Again, we, we have to consider trade-offs. Nuclear power is an alternative, wind, solar power. If you look at the experience of even of developing countries in Europe, Spain, well, Spain's a developed country technically, but um, if you look at the experience of the countries in Europe where they can afford it, they are currently pulling back from wind and solar power very rapidly, pulling subsidies away because these energy forms can't compete in the market with alternative forms of energy, fossil fuel energy or hydro energy. And hydro energy projects, they are expensive in the beginning, but then the water, uh, the, the water is relatively free. They are less expensive on a per megawatt basis by far than wind or solar power. And so there is a matter of cost and benefit. Roy, what about the other point that Emilio alluded to, and that is that local people don't see the benefits of these huge infrastructure projects, and this is not just in this project. We've seen it elsewhere in South America as well. We've seen it in Ecuador, we've seen it in Bolivia, we've seen it in Peru, et cetera, that uh, the benefits are exported as well. It is, I mean, it is the case everywhere that there will always be some people who are not satisfied with an outcome. Uh, now, as I was going to say earlier, if you compare this to the way China treated its people in moving them for the, the large Three Gorges Dam project, there's an entirely radically different world in terms of consultation and compensation. The idea that they're going to take the time to move graves as, and remains as opposed to simply flood the entire area. Um, and in the past in the U.S. when we built dams, we flooded whole towns. We didn't tear the, building downs, the buildings down or anything else. Um, there will always be some people who are disenfranchised, and, and that's the nature of a democracy. What's important is, you, as, as the, the, our guest said, the other guest said, you try to minimize these things, you try to account for sensitivities. But it's widely recognized in the law that democracies can't be held hostage to the last person who refuses to sell their house. You've gone through the other 2,500 houses. You've offered the fair market price. The last guy says, no, I want 5,000 times the market price. There's a recognition that the state has a legitimate function in saying, no, you can't hold out like that. We're going to condemn your property or you're going to take the fair market value. So, and that person will forever be disgruntled. And so there will always be people who are not happy with the outcome of the thing. And there is corruption issues. There are issues of the state taking money and not giving it to the indigenous people, even though they promised to do so. Uh, it, we unfortunately live in an imperfect world. But uh, this is a process looks, from the coverage, looks far better than others I've seen around the world, uh, especially in developing countries. That said, I don't think that we have many good examples in the world of large dam projects of this sort, even on the Brazilian side, that have ever really adequately implemented um, to a satisfactory extent all of the compensation measures that have been promised. Um, and just to speak for a second about what's going on at local levels, there's been an enormous PR campaign brought by this consortium that's planning on building the dam to, to win people's favor, uh, especially in the city of Altamira, which is the, the nearest big city uh, that will be affected by this dam. And while at first the mayor of Altamira was on board with the project and gave her endorsement to it, in the past few months she has um, completely reversed her position on the, on the dam issue. And in large part that's because the consortium hasn't been meeting the promises that it initially had promised to local people. You know, we talked about alternative sources of energy. Let's listen to uh, 
James Cameron, the movie director, he has pronounced on this. He's an Oscar-winning filmmaker. Uh, now, he made a movie which was called A Message from Pandora about the battle to stop the Belamonte Dam. Let's listen to what he told Al Jazeera, and he said this uh, in 2010. Let's watch. You got people in Sao Paulo saying, We've, we're having blackouts, we're having brownouts, we need energy. Um, the energy from this dam is not going to them. It's going to a few uh, aluminum s smelters in the area. And as we know, aluminum requires tremendous amounts of power in order to smelt. It's one of the most energy intensive uh, metal allergical processes out there. And it doesn't make very many jobs. Let's not use hydroelectric power and put blood clots in the life-giving arteries of, of the Amazon. You're at the equator. What's wrong with solar energy? You've got more solar flux than Germany by a factor of three, and Germany is, is leading, leading the world in, in, uh, in the amount of solar power it sends to its grid. So why not look at these alternatives? Craig Green, here we heard uh, James Cameron there, putting it very graphically, saying that hydroelectric power puts blood clots in the life-giving arteries of the Amazon. Um, What's wrong with solar power? Wind well, this power? is the problem when you have somebody who's paid to dramatize things, comment about things in the real world, which is they can't stop dramatizing things. Um, yes, it's true that we are going to have a footprint. All human activities have a footprint. Building the dam will have environmental consequences. To dramatize that and start talking about blood clots in the human circulation, in this Earth's circulation system, or the collapse of the lungs of Gaia in the rainforest, this kind of hyperbole really helps nothing and no one. And politicizing the event with films uh, simply helps nothing and no one. It just gives the groups who are already at odds another uh, knot in the rope of tug of war to play with. And so I would say, you know, one should be serious. And, and no offense, I would never tell him how to make films. He should probably not be telling people how to build dams or where to build them because he probably lacks the relevance. He does have a voice, though. Everyone has a voice, but not all voices are equally knowledgeable about the subject at hand. My yes. quick take May is I that um, a, a James point. Cameron has been... Sorry, let, let me like get Emilio in and then I'll come back to uh, Yes, I would like to clarify that there were different vintages of hydropower plants in the Amazon, and particularly, for instance, uh, the first vintage, the old uh, plants, the initial plants like Tukurui, were designed and built mainly for industrial projects in the region as aluminum smelters, and this is right and they were very bad in terms of environmental and social impacts. This second generation, uh, Belomont belongs to this one, is uh, different. 70% of this energy is going to be sold through the utilities to the general population. Only 20% of the uh, energy will be sold on the spot price to big enterprise. So this makes a big difference. And this is cheap energy, as I mentioned before. Uh, wind energy is doing a very important penetration in the Brazilian power market right. with 4,000 megawatts in the next year. S solar energy, in particular photovoltaics, will do the same. Okay. The problem is time. All this right. amount of energy, it's not easy to have in this uh, time frame at that price as we get from Okay, Th thanks, Emilio. Eve, I disturbed you. Um, in regard to the, the Hollywood celebrities that have been active on this case, my quick take is that uh, it, it's a, it makes clear to the international community uh, that this is an issue that is of concern to all of us, not just to the Brazilian government or the local people. Moreover, I think it helps to show the Brazilian okay. government that people are watching. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the show. Time's run out on us. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And that's it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what you think we should be covering. You can send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net.